All right, good morning. Presentation is second here, but I want to show you something real quick. But I'll, I'm going to talk for just a minute about my background, a couple minutes about the team I'm part of, and then go into some case studies about how we've applied this in the real world, real business applications for computational design to have an impact, um, in this case, in sustainability and in the um, medical industry. Just by way of introduction, um, <clears throat> Sorry. So I'm an industrial designer by trade. Um, you know, we all come from different parts, and I think everybody brings something interesting. Computational design is the common language, but we all have very unique perspectives looking into it. I got my start, and all, of all things, Tupperware. You know, um, in the uh, homeware, housewares industry. But very quickly, I found myself trying to, to parameterize entire ranges of containers and not design the same thing 20 times in different sizes and got very deep into parametrics, um, even though we were doing, you know, foodware and stuff like that. So that kind of got my brain ticking. We were doing a lot of whole patterns, a lot of things like that. And then very quickly I realized that I was a tech geek and I wanted to make a transition into the, the industry. So HP was kind enough to kind of take me on and I started w working on things like this, which is our, one of our printers for social media and kept kind of developing in the background my, my skills with computational design, starting out in Grasshopper. And as HP was also going, you know, full tilt into 3D printing and building, you know, 3D printers for production, very quickly those skills became kind of crucial to new businesses that we were starting. And I was able to be part of developing the team's um, capabilities inside of HP. So I'm going to talk about uh, two of these, about um, how we enabled through computational design, a uh, revolution in how molded fiber is made, and applying, you know, creating a, a, an orthotics brand with customized orthotics. So um, that's, that's me, real quick. And then as far as the team I'm a part of, actually I'll, I'll throw a few things up just to show the experiments that I was doing within HP before I was able to, you know, have this officially be my role. I was showing our managers things like this where I was saying, you know, we spend all day doing design languages, but, you know, we could, co we could codify those languages and, and expand upon them and also the, the, the various sizes and form factors. And so I'm starting to think about things in a, in a way where instead of talking about whether something should be organic or rectilinear, we just play with dials and try it and see what really works and get, get very deep into that. Um, and I was also trying to understand how, how form could be solved in a computational way, kind of pushing the limits of like something like kangaroo, trying to figure out what, what would this mean for design if we could leverage the, the forces um, within, you know, with, and what I'm already thinking about like tension and, and you know, with, within a surface or something like that, but have it actually solved from a set of curves. And so these are the things I'm playing with and I'm trying to push my skills into something like, you know, how would you 3D print a a weave for a custom fit geometry for like a, a headset. And this is me kind of on my own pushing, pushing capabilities, but then along comes, and I was kind of presenting this to the, the design teams internally, and then they came in with a need and they said, how do we do this? And I, I was able to engage. But real quick, now pivoting to the team that I'm a part of internally. Um, this is kind of a, an interesting slide. If you look, you know, within the uh, polymer space, this maps kind of the accuracy you need for a part and the, the level of kind of um, the number of parts or the quantities. And 3D printing and specifically MJF kind of lives in the middle sweet spot. Um, but mostly in the past it's been prototyping, you know, one-offs or iterative prototypes so that you can eventually go into another mode of production. But ultimately, you know, there's millions of individual files and applications in here and they're changing constantly. That's like a service bureau context. But we very quickly realized that within a, you know, what we have maybe a dozen applications or a handful of applications with slight differences between each file, you can have millions and millions of parts and we're interested in driving production of parts, not, not prototyping specifically. So to be able to do that, you have to leverage computational geometries, you know, whether it's a dental aligner that's being thermoformed onto a 3D printed part or a can in a ways that a human might not be able to understand intuitively. Um, and We've kind of, we, we saw that there was just a few categories that are really um, well positioned for this. And so we look, HP had 
um, three different internal verticals that were started up to kind of build our capabilities and start businesses in these contexts. We had a footwear, um, we have a footwear business, and basically that's leveraging engineered lattices, metamaterials with our specific materials so that we can create, you know, kind of a better than foam context with, um, you know, the right level of energy return and, and get, you know, really get performance improvements for, for athletes, for example. On the other hand, we have body fitment, which, you know, comes into footwear, but really plays well in the medical space. So anything from a scan for orthotics, prosthetics, things like that. HP started a business called Arise Orthotics, and I was part of that endeavor, which I'll get into a little bit. And then um, here, there's kind of this more industrial context of automated high mix, where you might be making, you know, a batch of 100 or 20, there might be tools or, or grabbers or something on an assembly line. You need to be able to to work very quickly, um, but you can enable the production of something else that wouldn't be possible or wouldn't be efficient um, or might not have the level of control you need. And then mass customization, I think that that will come more into play as the, the price point kind of matures around 3D printing, but once that's unlocked, you know, the world is our playground, right, as, as we have materials that can really do whatever we can envision. Um, so. The team that I'm a part of is now, those, those teams that were all developed for those individual, those um, internal s startups, we all came together at the end and said, hey, we just all fell into computational design, let's make a team and let's provide a service to our customers so that we can help them accelerate and get to the market faster, leveraging our capabilities and our experience. Um, but a lot of people think, you know, all you need is an idea and a printer, and design often gets, you know, kind of as an afterthought. But first you need some kind of concept or aesthetic design of how this thing's going to work, and then you need to, you know, really make a geometry workflow or design engine. So much goes into this. And the really hard part is the integration to make all that work together seamlessly, you know, in the cloud or, you know, to, to be more than just a demo. Um, so this team I'm a part of, we leverage all this deep additive experience and computational design experience, the assets we've produced to unlock applications, and we're going and finding, you know, different industries where we can apply this. It's really fun as a you know, as computational designer because one day I'm talking about uh, prosthetics, the next day I'm talking about eyewear, the next day I'm talking about you know, an industrial context or, or automotive. It's, it's very fulfilling in that regard. <clears throat> Essentially what we're trying to do is take all the work we put in over years to get over this learning curve and help other companies that are not as well funded you know, accelerate in, into their step into the market using all that um, experience. So jumping into some case studies, um, molded fiber, <coughs> excuse me. So just, just so you can kind of see it in context, this is one of our tool sets, but traditionally this would be done with a brass and steel tool set going through a paper slurry and you, you suck the slurry through, it's like a filter, it's like an egg carton or any kind of consumer packaging is made this way. It's been done in a you know, in the same way for basically for 100 years where you're CNCing or carving the, the steel and then you're making a custom wire mesh which is often cut into small pieces and welded back together, you know, in incredibly long lead times and a lot of um, highly skilled labor involved. So here's the opportunity that we had. Um, you know, metal molded fiber tooling, it's expensive, it's heavy, you, you might need a crane or multiple people to move it around, highly skilled labor, 12 weeks of, weeks of lead time. But we knew from printing some small coupons that we could um, make something 3D printed that was robust enough and, and had some potential. So we could replace that wire mesh and, and serve the industry in a fraction of the time with more control at a local level. So just, just to understand the complexity involved, you know, on the one side you see a wire mesh that's welded together just to make a square, a box, right? And we need to be able to reproduce that level of detail in 3D printing, um, which at the time, this is about you know, 20, 2020, pandemic's just starting at this point. And there was no millions of 300 micron holes in a part. Um, so we had to figure out how to do that programmatically. Um, you know, that we had engineers who were trying to do this in SolidWorks and then Grasshopper and just, yeah. <laughs> That's not going to work. You, you kind of peter out around a thousand holes if you have a really good computer in a you know a reps contest a, con a B reps context. Um, so that's problem number one. We just can't. The complexity, the raw complexity, is is more than we we can handle with off the shelf solutions. 
And then if we want to do this quickly, instead, you know, the CAD is unreliable. If you've ever tried thickening, a, offsetting a surface that has a small radius on it, you usually have to delete the radius and then thicken and add it back in. All these steps, these workarounds, resurfacing, it's just a complete mess and it's not really, you know, you might spend a day on a file or you might spend three weeks wrestling with a file that a customer gave you just to, just to patch it back together and, and that's not a way to start a business. So we had to solve this problem too. And then once you can do it, you know, are you just going to hire more and more CAD designers to scale the business? Um, ideally, no. You need to automate all of that to have an efficient business. So, so quick shout out to, to Mode Lab because at this point I had um, done a, I had kind of showed it was possible through Dendro and through Grasshopper with a tiny patch to say this is how we'd approach it. And they said, great, that looks promising. And I said, let's call on the Calvary because at the time our team was still developing. Um, gotten got engaged with Mode Lab with, with Ronnie, which I, I think pretty sure he's here. Um, yeah, <laughs> there you go. And uh, and we were off, you know, into this very deep, very specific context, um, highly engineered. You know, my background from industrial design, I was kind of shifting sides of my brain into this. But what we ended up building is um, this geometry pipeline that leverages voxel algorithms and an automatically you know, generates the entire tool stack. So we're doing CAD in a voxel context so that it's kind of never fails to solve the problem because it's just, you know, it's a simpler space to work in. And we digitally engineer millions of holes. There might be three or four of these parts strung together to make a, a larger part because the build volume is so big that we've made five foot long parts through this. Um, and all of this is happening through an interface that we developed in, in minutes instead of you know, three or four weeks to design, 12 weeks to, to produce. We can really change the, the paradigm there. Um, and there was a team inside of HP. We had you know, a whole site working on, uh, or, or part of a site working on this within HP that we had you know, four or five other people that I was part of and we were collaborating with Mode Lab as well. Um, and we built, we built this. Um, so essentially, So we didn't need to create a UI. This was, you know, because we had our own people internally. But um, you know, on the right, left, the right-hand side, we have our parameters. There's, you know, over three or four hundred parameters you can go in and control after you input the initial surface. And once you get everything set up the way you want to and customize to the machine you're going to put it in, then you press, you know, compute and out come all the whole locations to do the booleans with all of the complexities for managing the. You're supporting the screen because we need to print it on its own because it's so, you know, so detailed and then supporting it with this lattice. Um, you know, this is on par the complexity of like an injection molded tooling solution and automating that whole process. Um, and then, you know, just in the way of working, if you get, some of you might recognize that we're in Houdini in this context, but it's really just like a, we think of it as like an operating system for geometry where we can just go and build whatever we want in a sandbox together um, without limitations um, from, a, you know, from wherever a particular solution might be at that time. Um, so, you know, we're building nodes inside of nodes inside of nodes that we're then leveraging into new contexts and, and new business offerings as well, which is great for someone like me in an industrial design context to work with somebody with a computer science background, someone with an Emmy background, and we're all in here just uh, riffing off each other's work. Um, it's very efficient. So the result is we now have a fully automated perforation and tool stack design to locally vary the pulp thickness, which wasn't possible before. You didn't have the control to say, I want more pulp here or here or here. And now we can basically make parts that are you know, 20 or 30% lighter but have the same structural value. And that's huge for an industry that produces you know, millions a week, you know, the, the, the kind of volumes we're talking about there. This is a, this is a big deal. And they're also ultra light um, and fast to produce. Uh, and we've produced thousands of these production tool sets and are engaged with some of the largest um, molded fiber companies out there um, to, to start off with. Um, so, so that's the first one. And then I'll just kind of flip through the context of the Arise Orthotics. That, that, um, this project, we came in and they already had like an engineering solution, kind of a, a bare bones functional thing they were prototyping with, but they didn't have a design language to, to make it cohesive, to represent the brand out to, to the doctors and patients. And so we came in um, as a team, um, also pulled in um, some team members from Mode Lab and a number of internal team members. Went through the process of design, you know, like we would typically do, but we had to keep in mind that it should be extensible across any patient condition. And so here you have like the doctor's interface, 
where they've taken the scan, they're making their, their prescription and their treatment plan um, to be able to do those things all based on, specifically on the customer. But at the same time, you know, it has to look like a product. It has to have value in a, in, a, in a product context. And so we've added these elements to communicate the support that you're getting from it in a visual way. So when they unbox it, they feel confident, not embarrassed to show, you know, if, a, if someone were to see it. So they could actually tell someone else, hey, these are a great product and recommend them without feeling self-conscious. And that might need to incorporate a detail like this heel post, which is very exaggerated, <laughs> um, you know, to, and, and still be able to fit all that. Here's kind of the parametric thing, uh, the way that the design language actually scales across the part and how, how fluid that can be. And, you know, this level of consideration just to be able to get the design to be cohesive across, you know, any shape that we might have to put it on. Um, and then just one little tidbit, I'll, I'll let this play out where we're, we're leveraging this now into the same learnings that we've had into something like eyewear. Um, and then this is, and then I'll, I'll be done after this. But you can see, you know, you have the workflow, you have to derive the landmarks, you create the glasses procedurally, parametrically, but they're already custom fit to your face. You can choose your styles, but also, since this is basically a blend shape, you can, you can blend between all the styles. You can do all kinds of customization of the thickness, of the, of the tilt, and, and also for the, the, patient, the customer's um, specific, you know, facial geometry and eyesight. So, yeah, um, hopefully that was interesting for you guys, and uh, I'll leave it at that.